If someone were to ask you, what is meditation? How would you answer them? What's the first thing that would spring to mind? I imagine that for a lot of people, probably their first thoughts would be of monks sitting motionless for long periods of time, perhaps silently or perhaps repeating mantras over and over. And yes, certainly it's true that meditation is indeed often associated with these activities. But did you know that meditation is also central to martial arts like karate and judo, and that it can also be central to ordinary everyday activities like making a cup of tea and doing the washing up? In fact, as I discovered when I first started reading about meditation and joined a meditation group, virtually everything we can do can be done in a meditative way. Because at its core, meditation is essentially an exercise in regulating our focus of attention, becoming aware of where our attention is going and learning how to focus it in ways that are helpful to us in our everyday lives. Of course, there are many ways in which we can focus our attention, but by and large, meditation practices can be divided into two types. The first involves passive observation of something, for example, passive observation of our breathing or of something in our field of vision or of a sensation in our bodies or, or of our thoughts or of an activity we're performing. There are numerous things that we can choose to observe in a meditative way. And then the second major type of meditation practice involves some or other form of creative visualization. For example, visualizing a desired outcome for ourselves or for the world, or visualizing ourselves and other people in a certain way, for example, as souls rather than as physical bodies. So these are the two common approaches to meditation, both of which involve the focusing of our attention. In order to develop a clear understanding of what meditation involves, it's helpful to be aware of some of the most common misperceptions that people often hold about it. And perhaps the most common misperception is the tendency to equate meditation with relaxation, when really meditation and relaxation are two completely different things. Certainly it's true that meditation may result in a feeling of relaxation, and many people may meditate in the hope of becoming more relaxed, but meditation is not a form of relaxation and you don't have to be relaxed to, to meditate. And meditation doesn't have to make you feel relaxed. On the contrary, meditation is first and foremost a practice that makes you more fully aware of yourself and of what you're experiencing and what you're doing, <clears throat> quite irrespective of what those experiences and actions are. When you meditate, you may be sitting quietly feeling peaceful and relaxed, or you may be walking or running or dancing or even fighting. All of these activities can be forms of meditation. Another common misperception about meditation is that it involves emptying your mind of all thoughts. The reality is that it's not necessary to empty your mind in order to meditate. And although some meditation practices may result in periods without any thoughts entering the mind, this is not a measure of successful meditation. It's important to understand that it's quite natural and healthy for our minds to perceive thoughts, just as it's natural and healthy for our ears to hear sounds. Meditation may, however, help us control our ability to not be distracted by the thoughts that enter our mind and to maintain our focus of attention on whatever we've decided to focus it on. A third important point is that it's not necessary to believe in any particular religious or moral doctrine to meditate. Although meditation practices are often associated with religious practices and beliefs, it's perfectly possible to develop a profound and powerful practice of meditation without any religious affiliation or beliefs. Indeed, in recent years, a number of experienced meditators, the best known being Professor John Kabat-Zinn at the University of Massachusetts, have devised a series of mindfulness courses which are now taught worldwide 
that introduce people to the basics of meditation practice without any of the religious or cultural trimmings that are often associated with meditation. At the end of the talk, I'll provide a reference to a useful book by Mark Williams and Danny Penman, which describes these courses in detail. So how may meditation help people who stammer? Well, because first and foremost, meditation is a practice that helps people to develop more control over where their, over where their attention goes, it's likely to help people who stammer because stammering is a condition that is strongly influenced by the things we pay attention to. For example, we generally stammer more when our minds scan ahead to imagine potential problems. And we're likely to stammer more in situations where we worry that, that we're going to stammer, or where we anticipate that our listeners are not going to understand us, or that they're going to respond negatively to what we have to say. If we can train ourselves through meditation not to pay attention to such worries and anticipations, then almost certainly we'll find that our tendency to stammer will reduce. Similarly, we tend to stammer more when we fall into the trap of negatively evaluating our performance. For example, when we perceive that our speech is not good enough, when we don't like how we sound, and when we perceive that we should do better. All of these negative perceptions, these negative value judgments about our speaking performance increase our tendency to block and to stammer in the future. Because meditation reduces the tendency to judge things, it should reduce our, our tendency to make negative value judgments about our speech. And the fewer negative value judgments we make about our speech, the less we're likely to stammer. And finally, meditation and the increased level of self-control that it brings should reduce our tendency to become overwhelmed by emotion or to panic when speaking. This is important because a common finding of people who stammer is that when they panic and are overwhelmed by emotions, they find themselves automatically reacting to their blocks in ways that are extreme and unhelpful. In contrast, by reducing this tendency, Meditation should enable us to respond to our blocks in ways that are more appropriate. So what does meditation actually involve? Well, there are two types of meditation practice, formal meditation and meditation or mindfulness while performing everyday tasks. Formal meditation involves setting aside some special time each day, specially for meditation. So, for example, every morning after waking up and having a shower and a cup of tea, I go to a room in my house that I use for sitting meditation and I spend 30 minutes sitting on a cushion, focusing my attention on my breathing. And I do the same thing every evening before I go to bed. But there are many formal meditation practices that you can do and they don't all involve sitting still. One can do walking meditation. Also, yoga is a form of is a formal meditation practice at our Tai Chi and Qigong. The key thing about formal meditation practices is that they're practices that we do specially to provide opportunities for meditation and for no other reason. The other main type of meditation practice is meditation or mindfulness while performing ordinary everyday tasks. This type of meditation is sometimes referred to as mindfulness in action. And we can turn more or less any task into a form of meditation in action or mindfulness in action. Washing the dishes, driving the car, ironing one's clothes. All of these things are opportunities for mindfulness in action. The key is to make special effort to pay undivided attention to performing these tasks and to pull your attention back to the task whenever you notice that it has wandered off. Over time, our ability to perform everyday actions without becoming distracted by other things will increase, and we'll find that our ability to focus on the task at hand will also increase. I want to say a few words about the most commonly used type of formal meditation. It involves sitting quietly with a straight back and making effort to pay attention to something. Although theoretically one can pay attention to anything during formal meditation, 
A good starting point is to practice paying attention to the various feelings that occur in our bodies due to our breathing. In particular, the feeling of the breath entering and leaving the body and the movements that occur in our bodies as the breath enters and leaves. Invariably, if you do this formal meditation, after a few seconds or minutes you'll find that your attention has wandered off somewhere, perhaps to some noises of traffic going past outside, or, or to some passing thoughts, or to some other feelings in your body that have nothing to do with your breathing. It's quite natural for your attention to wander in this way. Everybody's attention does, and it's absolutely fine that it does. The important practice in formal meditation is as follows. As soon as you notice that your attention has wandered off somewhere, notice where it's wandered to and then gently pull it back to whatever it is that you're trying to pay attention to. The majority of the time during which you're doing formal meditation, you'll just be repeatedly noticing that your attention has wandered off somewhere and pulling it back. Essentially, formal meditation is an exercise in noticing where your attention's wandered to and repeatedly pulling it back, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of times, to whatever it is that you want to pay attention to. Then gradually, over the weeks, months and years that you, that you do meditation, you'll find that if you do it regularly and consistently, gradually your mind will tend to wander less and it'll be easier to focus it on the things that you want to focus it on. Realistically speaking, unless you don't have to work, the amount of time each day that you're able to devote to formal meditation will probably be relatively limited. And if you have a busy life that's full of responsibilities, you may find it difficult to set aside much time at all, unless you're able to cut out some other activities in order to create some time. So for many people, it may simply not be possible to do much formal meditation. In contrast, mindfulness during everyday tasks, mindfulness in action, is something that all of us can do. And although it may seem less special and less appealing, it is in fact every bit as powerful and important. Indeed, in my experience, my efforts to be mindful while performing everyday tasks seem to have had more of a positive impact on my stammering than the formal meditation although I have no doubt that one benefits most of all from doing both. Mindfulness during everyday tasks involves making special effort to pay full and undivided attention to the task at hand. As a Chinese Zen monk Lin Ji said more than a thousand years ago, when walking, just walk, when sitting, just sit, and above all, don't wobble. The secret is just paying attention to one thing at a time and to doing it wholeheartedly and pulling your attention back to whatever you're doing whenever you find that it has wandered off. The term single-pointedness is often used to describe the focus of attention that is ideal for mindfulness in action. This single-pointedness is in many ways the precise opposite to what many people in the modern world habitually do. Indeed, much of our modern lifestyle results in a fragmentation of our attention and a reduction in our ability to control where our attention goes. Of course, just as we can walk mindfully and sit mindfully, we can also speak mindfully. And as a person who stammers, it's only natural to wonder whether, if I speak mindfully, will it make me stammer less? I think this is a question that each of us needs to find the answer for ourselves through our own experimentation. And perhaps a good starting point is to observe what aspects of your speech you normally focus on when you speak. In fact, there are many aspects of our speech that we can focus our attention on when we speak, including, for example, the sounds we make, the tone of our voice, the physical feelings of speaking, the rhythm and the forward flow of our speech, how our listeners are responding to our speech, and it's also possible to take a step back and focus more broadly on the overall process of speaking rather than focus on any particular aspect of it. You can also experiment with focusing your attention in these different ways while speaking, 
And if you do, you'll almost certainly find that you stutter more when focusing on some aspects of speech than on others. You'll probably also find that there are some aspects of, of your speech that you don't like. Personally, I used to hate the sound of my voice when I focused on it. I noticed that it often sounded tense and nervous and uncertain, even when I wasn't actually stammering. And each time that I noticed my speech sounding like this, I found myself thinking that it wasn't good enough. I also found that my attention was strongly pulled by any words that came out of my mouth differently to how I intended. And whenever this happened, I tended once again to evaluate my performance negatively. Similarly, I found that when I observed the responses of the people I was speaking to, I had a deeply ingrained tendency to focus on any response that indicated that they were getting impatient or bored. And immediately, I would start thinking that I wasn't speaking well enough and that I had to speak better. I also noticed that all of these negative value judgments that I made tended to have the effect of increasing the amount that I stammered. I want to say a little more about the problem of negative value judgments. People who stammer, stammer more when they perceive that their speech isn't good enough, when they anticipate the need to speak better, and when they anticipate the need to try harder. In contrast, we tend to stammer less when we anticipate that our speech is going to be good enough and that our listeners are going to respond positively to us. In other words, we stammer more when we make negative value judgments about our performance or anticipated performance. This is a real problem for people who stammer because most of us have so many past painful memories of our stammering having led to communication failure and rejection. And as a result, we tend to fall into a sort of vicious circle whereby those unpleasant and traumatic past memories of stammering and of communication failure undermine our faith in our current ability to speak well enough. Because of this lack of faith, when we try to speak, our attention tends to get pulled towards all of the things that we feel are wrong. And the more our attention is pulled to what we perceive is wrong, the more we tend to stammer. When I first started to experiment with meditation, I thought that the key to overcoming stammering may be to learn how to shift my focus of attention away from the aspects of my speech that upset me, that is, away from the aspects of it that I didn't like, and focus instead on other aspects of it, aspects that didn't disturb me. And in particular, I trained myself to focus my attention on maintaining a sort of rhythm to my speech and on maintaining the forward flow. And to a large extent, I found that this helped me remain fluent. I found that when I did this, it naturally pulled my attention away from all those other aspects of my speech that I didn't like. Essentially, what I was learning to do was a sort of mindful version of a fluency shaping technique. Although this approach certainly helped me become more fluent, as time went on, I started to become aware that it was not really reducing my underlying fear of stammering, even though it was making me more fluent. More recently, it occurred to me that what I also needed to do was to stop evaluating my performance negatively, and that rather than trying to pull my focus attention away from the things that disturbed me, that is the things that I didn't like about my speech, I also needed to stop making negative value judgments about the aspects of my speech that I didn't like, so that they no longer disturbed me. As I mentioned earlier, one of the key benefits of meditation, of mindfulness, is that it reduces our tendency to make value judgments of any kind, positive or negative. When we focus our attention strongly on simply observing something, the tendency to make value judgments about that thing naturally reduces. Over the long term, I found that this practice of non-judgmental observation is the meditation approach that has helped me most with my stammering. Instead of trying to pull my attention away from the aspects of my speech that I don't like, or that have tended in the past to upset me or to destabilize me, I simply passively observe what happens when I speak and accept it. 
I find that it helps to imagine myself observing the whole process of speaking from a distance without particularly focusing on any of the details. I also allow myself to block and to get stuck. I accept it and I deal with each block in the most pragmatic way possible. As children grow and develop language, inevitably their attention is pulled more and more towards their thoughts and less towards the raw experiences of their sense organs. Because of this, their beliefs about themselves and the world around them tend to become relatively fixed and rigid. And most people's beliefs about themselves and their worldviews are largely based upon their experiences from their early childhood. Meditation is undoubtedly one of the best ways of bringing us back into touch with the reality of the present moment and the reality of our present abilities. The more we focus our attention on the raw experiences of the present moment, the more we're likely to become aware that many of our beliefs and understandings are indeed outdated. And as we realise this, those beliefs and understandings will naturally change and update themselves. So because meditation and mindfulness naturally promote our cognitive development in this way, they're valuable tools to help us manage our stammering to the best of our current capacities. Whatever approach or form of therapy for stammering we might decide to adopt or engage with, whether it be speech therapy or cognitive therapy, if we also practice meditation alongside it, the meditation will help us to get the best out of it. So if you are indeed interested in taking up meditation, and if you've not already done so, I would definitely encourage you to do so. To start off with, it's useful to read some books about it. And in the next slide, I give some references to books that I've found helpful. Then I strongly advise you to find a meditation group that you feel comfortable with and to join in with their meditation sessions. Most people find that meditating in a group is much easier than meditating alone, especially when first starting off. Meditation is a long-term investment and it may take some time before you start to feel its benefits. Although many people experience a sort of honeymoon effect when they first start, more often than not that effect is relatively short-lived and in order to reap its true benefits it's important to stick with it if and when that effect wears off and the hard work begins. If you do stick with it and establish a regular practice and regularity is important, it'll change your life 